just as sure as he designed Eve for Adam and gave Eve to him. I say that to say this. God tailor-made you. God designed you. God created you for deep fellowship with himself. And even after Adam and Eve were brought together as husband and wife, God virtually said to them, okay, move over. I'm going to walk with you daily in the garden. And that's fellowship with God. I want to turn to John chapter 17. Okay. John chapter 17. While you're turning there, I would just uh, begin by saying this. You and I may not be aware of it, but Christianity is actually on the increase in countries around the world. But here's the sad truth. It seems to be on the decline here in the United States of America. And I've thought about that, and I've wondered why. And I think, in fact, I'm convinced that one of the main reasons why that is, is the way that we have presented the gospel in the United States of America. I think that we've been guilty, and I'm, I'm... pointing at myself too. I think that we've been guilty of just largely reducing the gospel to a way of escaping hell, a way to avoid the consequences of our sin, uh, to bypass eternal judgment. And I'm not saying that that is not an appeal that should... uh, that that we that we shouldn't make that appeal to lost people because that's the level on which they live and they can understand but i think that if we are sharing the gospel as a way to be listen to me to be freed from the consequences of sin rather than to be freed from sin that causes the consequences we've kind of misrepresented things so If you think about it, if we are mainly presenting a gospel for people to escape the consequences of sin, we are presenting the gospel with a very selfish appeal. Now, I understand that's where human beings live, on a very natural and selfish level. But here's the problem. If people get saved on that level, Often, then, it creates a Christianity that is self-centered. That's the problem. We have, I think, in the United States of America, a church that is uh, primarily self-centered. By that I mean, if you're saved, do you think that the Lord Jesus wants you to do more than look out for yourself? Do you think that he wants you to do more as a believer than to protect yourself and your loved ones? I want to turn your attention to the 17th chapter of John because I see here the desire of the heart of God. And the desire of the heart of God is really at the center of what the gospel is all about. It's about God's desire. Jesus says these words in John 17. He's speaking these words as he faces the cross on the last night here on earth. And he tells us what God really wants. Let's read it. In John 17, verse 1, Jesus, it's a prayer. He spake these words as he lifted his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life 
to as many as thou hast given him. Now, look at the third verse. He said, God's desire to give eternal life. Now he defines eternal life for us. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You know what God really wants? The desire of God that needs to be communicated in our gospel pre presentation. What God really wants is he simply wants you and I and other people to know him. He wants us to know him. And you know, that is really unique to Christianity, to knowing God. That's what Bible Christianity has to offer the world that no other religion can. I can honestly stand before you this evening and say that Islam's Allah does not want you to have a loving personal relationship with him. But our God, the God of the Bible, he wants a very personal, loving relationship with you. He, he wants you to take him as your savior, not merely as an escape route from judgment, but he wants you to enter into a personal, loving relationship with him, to know him. That's unique to biblical Christianity. And what he's talking about here when he says, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, that you might know God. He's talking about something very intimate. A knowledge that is not mere head knowledge, but actually that word know is rooted in the marriage bed. It's the most intimate, it, it, uh, it comes out of the most intimate physical relationship of a human husband and wife that they share together. That's the basis for knowing God. That is, he wants you to know him in a unimaginable, intimate way. But also, God wants us to know him and he wants us to know him so bad that that desire of God has brought him to self-sacrifice. That desire is so strong that God, the Son, voluntarily left the splendor of heaven, came to this cursed earth, took on all the limitations of becoming a human being, while at the same time retaining his godhood. He willingly subjected himself to the cruel torture and the shameful naked crucifixion. That's how much he wants you and I to know him. The songwriter put it like this. He left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, then the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky, and little sparrows can't fly. Yes, if that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this if that isn't love. This is the degree of desire that God has for human beings like you and me. He wants people to know him in this unique, in this intimate, in this self-sacrificing way. You know, the Bible demonstrates this all the way through. And the way that God does it is he uses a number of biblical metaphors, figures of speech to express his relationship that he wants you to have with him and he wants to have with you. And because of our time, I'm just going to look briefly at five of them. And the first one is what we might call friendship. 
You know, when you open the Bible, the idea of friendship with God appears first in the book of Genesis. In fact, three times in the Bible, we are told that Abraham was the friend of God. <laughs> That's an amazing thing, that God would have a, a human being as his, as his friend. Now think about it. Abraham, he never even heard of the Ten Commandments. Abraham never read a Bible. Uh, Abraham had no knowledge about the church, the body of Christ. But he lived in a relationship with God. The emphasis in the book of Genesis, if you really think about it, is not so much on obedience as it is on walk. Not so much on obedience to God, but a walk with God. It begins in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. We are told that that man Enoch in Genesis 5 walked with God and one day God took him. He disappeared, he vanished because of his closeness with God. We are told that Noah was a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a man that walked with God. And Abraham himself is told by God, walk with me. And he was called God's friend. You know, we only want to walk with people that we like. We only want to ever walk with people that we want to know better. The fact that God would call anyone who is a human being to walk with him tells me this. God likes me. God likes you. You know, think about it. We, all, we always talk about God loves us. But you know what? God likes you. There are people that we're supposed to love that we don't like. But the fact that God walks with us he likes us. He likes human beings. And he wants a relationship with them. And he, he, he wants us to walk with him. He, he motivates us to walk with him. He wants a friendship with human beings. Can you imagine that? He's the great creator, but he wants our friendship. Have you been a friend of God's? There's a second metaphor that the Bible develops very early on. Not only friendship, but the second one is family. Did you know that the first implication of God and us being family occurs in Exodus chapter 4, where God refers to Israel as his son, his firstborn son. And uh, that's, uh, that's the beginning of this family metaphor that the New Testament fully develops for us. When Jesus is asked by his disciples to teach them to pray, he says, when you pray, call God our Father. Call him Father. And we call him Father because we're joined to God himself. The Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are born again, is actually joined to your human spirit. And at that moment, you are born of God. You are become a child of God. You become a member of God's spiritual family. And God wants humans to share the same relationship with him that his son. The Father wants you and I to share the same relationship with him that he shares with his Son. Listen how Jesus prays it in John 17, 21. He, he prays that they, meaning believers, all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you've sent me. That's what he wants. And the Holy Spirit of God, if he is in you, 
If he lives in your human spirit, if you're born again, he does. The Holy Spirit of God cries out deep within your spirit, Abba, Father, Papa, because you're joined to him and you have the deepest intimacy in that family bond imaginable. There is a third metaphor I would mention tonight that the Bible develops to get us to dem to demonstrate to us the desire that God has for us to know him. And the third metaphor is marriage. You realize the Bible begins with a marriage of Adam and Eve in the garden, and it ends in Revelation with the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, you will see that Israel is referred to as God's wife. She's God's wife on earth, you might say. But in the New Testament, the church is God's heavenly bride. And there is no marriage in heaven, we're told. And I think that's because we'll all be married to the Lamb. We'll all be married to Him. The most intimate relationship that human beings have is the husband and wife relationship. It's above the relationship, obviously, of parents. Even a mother and a babe is a husband and wife, that intimate relationship that they share together. And when the bride in a wedding ceremony says, I do, she is saying, I'm ready to leave all behind to be with my husband. And you know, folks, that illustrates exactly what God wants you to do. In fact, Jesus says it several times in the Gospels. If you love husband or wife more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love husband or wife more than me, you can't be my follower. You really can't genuinely be my disciple. There's a fourth metaphor that demonstrates God's desire for you and I to know him. It's the matter of God indwelling us. I said, Emmanuel, God with us is a wonderful thought, but there's something even more wonderful than that. And that is that God not only is with us, God is in us. He actually is in us. That illustrates an even more intimate relationship that God wants with you and I than the marriage pictures. In fact, the first mention of this is in the upper room, which is, of course, just hours before the crucifixion. And in John chapter 14 and verses 16 and 17, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to pray the Father. He'll give you another comforter, another person who will stand beside you as I have, another person of the Godhead, another comforter, that he may be, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it doesn't see him, neither knows him, but you know him. Listen to this. Jesus says this before the Holy Spirit ever came to indwell. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And we know that happened 50 days later, right? On the day of Pentecost. He came to indwell. And Christ not only is with you, he is in you. And Paul develops that thought so brilliantly in the, in the epistles that he's written. And he uses that little preposition in, in, in Christ, in Christ. Christ in you, he says, the hope of glory. In the book of Colossians, I believe the whole book of Colossians is an emphasis of the fact that Christ indwells you. It's a permanent arrangement that enables believers to be personally empowered, and it guarantees every believer a new resurrection body in the future and an eternal relationship, the indwelling spirit.
It's God's, he, he is God's down payment, you might say. He's the guarantee that what God has promised us to be a full package of salvation, it's going to happen because of the indwelling of God. The fifth and final metaphor that I believe the Bible gives us to demonstrate God's desire for us to know him, to have this relationship with him, is what I would call identity. By that I mean that really the deepest expression of the relationship that God wants with you. It, it was hinted in the Gospels, and I just want to read a, a few uh, passages that Jesus threw out at his disciples, and I don't think that they got it. It, it. And I don't know that I got it when I read it, but listen what he says to them. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And then in another passage in, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 10, he says this to his disciples, he that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me, and he that despiseth me, dis despiseth him that sent me. So he's hinting at our identity with Christ, with God. And of course, it's clearly spelled out in the epistles. And I would think uh, specifically of this uh, passage that Paul brings it out in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and uh, verse 15. He says, don't you know that your, body are, your bodies are the members of Christ? You've been joined as a believer to Christ. And then he gets even more specific. And he says in verse 17, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What he means by that is, as a believer, you have been joined to Jesus Christ. And the way that that has taken place is the spirit of Christ himself, again, has connected and joined God himself with your human spirit the moment you were born again. And so you are totally identified with Christ in that way. You're joined with Christ. You're one spirit with him. You know, prior to salvation, we find our identity in a whole bunch of things. Naturally, Without Christ, we find our identity in sometimes the things that we did or the things that we do. Oh, I'm a student, or I'm a teacher, or, you know, the work that we perform, or the career that we have, or even the family, our, our physical family, or we're athletes, or we're musicians, or some status that we identify ourselves by. We have money, we have looks, or we have achieve certain things. And that's how lost people identify themselves. But that's not how we should identify ourselves. You shouldn't be identified as whatever your job skill might be, or whatever you might think is commendable. Your identity is in Christ, because you are joined to him. And if your meaning and your purpose in life is maintained by these natural things that you say define you, you're going to be sorely disappointed because, you know, I was just thinking about it today, you know, a, a, a beautiful model, uh, a, a female model uh, back in 1970, she's 70 years old today, you know. She was 20 then, she's 70 years old today. And guess what? She's all wrinkled. The beauty's gone. We can't, we can't have our identity define us by natural things. Our identity is in Christ. And that's what messes up a lot of Christians because they identify themselves by the wrong things or the, by the wrong person instead of by Christ. You are a precious child of God. 
and you're a fully accepted member of God's family, and you are joined and are a vital part of Jesus's body, the body of Christ, as he says in that 15th verse of 1 Corinthians 6, and you are accepted in the beloved. The beloved, capital B, meaning the beloved one, Jesus. That's the basis of your acceptance, which means the only way that you could ever lose your acceptance with God is if God becomes displeased with Jesus. On your worst performance day spiritually, you're just as accepted by God as ever because your acceptance isn't based upon your performance, but upon Jesus who you are identified with. Isn't that wonderful? The Bible calls us saints. The Roman Catholic Church has no clue what a saint is. A saint has nothing to do with the canonization of uh, a, a particular person who performed some type of a miracle and lived a holy life by human standards. The Corinthian Christians that were that whole church was just uh, just plagued with sin problems, and yet Paul writes to them and calls them saints because you're accepted in the beloved, because you're a saint, because you are identified completely completely with Christ. That's how he sees you. It's like if I take this pen that represents me, a believer, and I put it in this Bible that represents Christ. When God looks at me, he sees me in Christ, and he's pleased with him. And that's my identity. That's who I am. You know, my wife and I, hard to believe, we've been married close to 50 years. And I'm convinced took me a while, but now I'm totally convinced that she is tailor-made and designed by God for me, and that God gave her to me as a gift. And so I have to remind myself whenever I feel critical towards her, that indirectly I'm criticizing God, because he gave her as a gracious gift to me just as sure as he designed Eve for Adam and gave Eve to him. I say that to say this. God tailor-made you. God designed you. God created you for deep fellowship with himself. And even after Adam and Eve were brought together as husband and wife, God virtually said to them, okay, move over. I'm going to walk with you daily in the garden. And that's fellowship with God. And that's what you and I and every human being have been brought into this world for. We've, cre we've been created for fellowship with him. And I think that's why every good atheist that I've ever met is angry. Not because he knows there's no God, but because he knows there ought to be and he can't find them. Because it's intuitive and it's inbred in the human heart that God made us for himself and he wants us to know him. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. God's desire and over and over demonstrated in his word.